to be a lawyer? Well, um, you know, when I was a very little girl, I had no idea what I wanted to be. I sort of veered from becoming an air hostess for the glamour, of course, um, to being a doctor until, you know, my interest, I realized my interest in science was very minimal. But finally, I think when I was about 15 or 16, my English teacher told me that um, I had the attributes required to be a lawyer. And he didn't mean intellect. I think he meant I talked a lot. Yeah. <laughs> especially in class. So he recommended it and I thought about it and I read up about it and I thought, no, I could really, I could really be, be happy uh, because I see the law as um, an instrument for social change. You can do so much with the law to really ensure that society is a better place. And so I thought, I, I can do this. So in, uh, where, did you, where did you do your schooling? So I went to school in Fiji okay. um, up till uh, secondary school, the end of secondary school. Right. And then I went to Sussex University in the UK. Okay. And then I went to Cambridge, uh, also in the UK. Then I went to do my bar finals um, at Inner Temple in London. I went back to Fiji. I worked as a prosecutor for a few years. Um, and then we had a military coup in 1987. Mm -hmm. And that created quite a lot of difficulties for lawyers. They weren't sure whether the rule of law was going to be restored. And fortunately, it coincided for me with a scholarship by the British government to go and do another master's, again at Cambridge. So I went back to do a master's in criminology. And then I came back uh, to Fiji, and then I carried on in the prosecution office. Things had become much more stable. We had um, a constitution. We had a civilian government. Um, so it was really, um, it was still a risk uh, as to whether this was going to work, but I really believe that lawyers have a role in Fiji and they, and they must play it. You mentioned the coup in 1987. Mm -hmm. uh, when you came back, was that still a prosecutorial process going on to identify those who were coup leaders? Did, were you part of that at all? No, because um, what, had, what had actually happened was that in the new constitution, immunity had been granted to the coup leaders. But what was very significant and was not covered by the immunity was the level of corruption that we were required to investigate and prosecute. And one very well known uh, case that we were required to look at was the facts around the collapse of the National Bank of Fiji, mm -hmm. um, which involved high level ministers, um, uh, some dignitaries, some very well known business leaders, and so we were really prosecuting uh, a number of cases around that collapse for both fraud, corruption, um, a number of corporate offences. And it really was a test of Fiji's legal system as to whether we could try people who held positions of power and influence. Well, it, it, that's a good, we heard a little bit about that from Ambassador Van Schack about capacity. Mm -hmm. And the Ukrainian, if they took on jurisdiction domestically, did they have the capacity to do that? Did you and Fiji have the same, feel like you had to out, reach out to perhaps London or any place else for assistance in uh, preparing for these cases? Well, a number of countries of the world were waiting to see what was happening in Fiji. Uh -huh. Whether we were going to survive this transitional period and really restore, um, substantive democracy um, and really the test was for the legal system as well as to whether the legal system was going to stand up to scrutiny so what i did because at that time then i become the director of public prosecutions and this was in 1994 mm -hmm. uh, when we were prosecuting these cases and so what i did was we advertised all around the world for prosecutors we said you know if you are interested in coming to help us re-establish the rule of law in a country that's been through a very difficult time, please come. We need a high level of professionalism and we need lawyers who belong in law societies which are used to professionalism, to ethics. And they did. We got so many lawyers who came who worked in the DPP's office. I still remember them with great fondness because they helped us to prosecute at a very difficult time. And I believe we did establish um, a very strong and stable prosecution office as a result of those efforts. We didn't win all our cases, mm -hmm. 
because we were still battling with uh, difficulties with the judiciary. We, after the, the coup, of course, all the judges were removed or had resigned. So this was a new judiciary and we were appearing before the judges appointed under a new judiciary and they were ongoing challenges mm -hmm. in relation to that. So, so we didn't win all our cases, but I think we didn't stop trying. And in those attempts, I think we really proved to the public, who are the main stakeholders for any prosecution office, we proved to the public that we meant it. We wanted to hold people to account. Did you feel like you were gaining a, you personally a, a reputation at that time? Uh, had you been covered in the papers? I mean, was it yes, a, yes, yes. I mean, the papers had almost every chapter of our struggle. <laughs> so you know, we at one stage discovered that there was forum shopping going on in the magistrates' court. That mm. defence lawyers were going and picking their magistrates. And um, I asked one of the prosecutors, a, a British uh, prosecutor. I said, when, it, when her case was inexplicably moved from one magistrate to another, I said, ask the magistrate how the case got moved, because on the cause list, it was before someone else. So she asked, and she was cited for contempt of court uh. for asking, because obviously underlying the question was that something untoward had happened in the allocation of cases. So we defended her. I defended her. I instructed a counsel. And the idea really in that defense was to expose the forum shopping, as well as, of course, to ensure that there was no stain on her name. I mean, she was a professional. She came from a country with high professional standards. I didn't want her going back with a conviction. Right. So we succeeded on both fronts. We exposed the forum shopping, and she was eventually acquitted. But it meant that all of this was fought in, in front of the media. Necessarily, it had to be fought in front of the media for transparency. And I think the media really understood what we were trying to do. There were some very robust articles about the judiciary, and they were all supportive of the DPP's office. So I think in, in that time, we grew in credibility. And another example is when we fought very hard to have special measures in the magistrate's court for hearing the evidence of children. Mm -hmm. We introduced screens and closed circuit television for the first time. And in making those applications with a lot of resistance from the defense, which I have to say was misogynist largely, they're mostly men at that time, there were very few women lawyers. And many lawyers in Fiji felt that there was nothing wrong with the old ways. So trying to break that mold was extremely difficult, but again, the media was with us. And because the media was, was with us, the people of Fiji, I think, were with us too. How do you educate the media? I mean, that's an ongoing legal question because at least in the United States, they'll pop in, they'll pop out, and people are looking for 30 second sound bites. Uh, how, did you have an active media policy? Yeah. Yes. I mean, I think the first step is to have a media policy and to engage the media in drawing up the media policy. I don't think media policies should be imposed on the media. I think it's a good idea. We had a media council at that time, mm -hmm. made up of the heads of all of the media agencies in Fiji. The media was self-regulated. Um, so we had a, a, a meeting with them. We showed them the media policy. They told us what they thought was wrong with it. Uh, we changed it. We incorporate their recommendations, some of them. Some of them we didn't agree with. And then we launched it, and then we stuck to it. So there were no quiet, exclusive interviews with chosen media representatives. We gave media uh, conferences, everybody got the same information, and I think the media appreciated that kind of openness. So I, I think really a DPP's office or prosecution office must have a media policy, an outreach policy, and be as transparent as it can be, given the fact that most of our work must be confidential. Segwaying a little bit, perhaps to your current job, and you can tell me at some point this is not appropriate, but that media outlet process policy, are you bringing some of that to bear in what you're doing now? I don't need to. I think the prosecutor already has a very good uh, media strategy, and we've just um, taken on someone who is um, a communications specialist mm -hmm. who knows all of this. I don't think the prosecutor needs any advice on this matter, but I do think that the scrutiny that the International Criminal Court is under is quite unprecedented. 
uh, I think everything we do, everywhere we go, uh, every single word spoken is exposed in some way to scrutiny, to criticism, to deconstruction. And so we have to be ready for that. And we also have to be very sure about what we're saying about the court. So there's no misunderstanding. So your background and all of that is helpful, no doubt, in what you're... I haven't had any conversations with the prosecutor about media strategy because I think we have already have a good yeah, one. Yeah. Uh, go back, to your, back to your life. So here you are in Fiji, you're in the prosecutor's uh, staff, and you are making progress. Post-coup, you're making progress. Uh, carry on from there. I mean, we're at sort of a point in your life uh, in the 2004-05 time period. No, this was uh, in the 1990s. So oh, I became I became the director of public prosecutions in 1994. Okay, thank you. After acting in the post for a year, the former DPP had become the solicitor general, um, and then I stayed as DPP until 1999. Okay. Now, by 1999, we had a new constitution, which was. Um, uh, passed as a result of consultations, a constitutional review process, a very credible review commission. Uh, the former Governor General of New Zealand was the chair of it. And one of the great things about this constitution, the 1997 constitution, was a very strong Bill of Rights. Strong protective measures for the judiciary. And so I was, in fact, the first judge to be appointed under that constitution in 1999. Um, and the, the process was a parliamentary process. There was a parliamentary uh, uh, committee set up to scrutinize the uh, applications of the judges. I was also the first woman to become a judge in Fiji. Mm. Um, and um, I don't think there was any dissent uh, from the parliamentary committee. I think they were all happy with the, with the recommendation of the Attorney General. And then I was appointed by uh, the president of Fiji. And then I became a judge and I was a judge for 10 years. Two years I was after I had been appointed, we had another coup, this time a civilian one, uh, although supported by some factions in the military because they had arms. It was an unsuccessful coup and the, the coup leaders were arrested and brought before the courts and I was one of the judges who had to try some of them, including the then Vice President of Fiji, um, who did not step down for the trial, who continued to be Vice President. Um, who came every day to court in you know, a limousine with bodyguards and so on. And I think in, in that trial, I was reminded of you know, the, awful, um, the awful presence of the law, that no matter who you are, no matter how you come to court or how many bodyguards you have, there's just this one judge sitting on the bench at the end of the day who's going to determine the law in relation to your behavior. And it really did, I think, press home to the people of Fiji that the justice system worked. Um, and I was still quite young uh, at that time and I took on, of course, this enormous case at the request of the Chief Justice. And all of those people were convicted and imprisoned um, and some of them are still in custody. But it was an incredibly difficult trial for Fiji to watch day after day and in trepidation as to what was going to happen, are people going to get away with it, um, and, and a huge responsibility on me to adhere to the law, to be absolutely scrupulous about every decision I made because I wasn't just protecting the rights of the people of Fiji to see justice, I was also protecting the rights of the accused persons to a fair trial. So all of that, I think that experience was incredible. That was in 2002, following uh, the civilian coup of 2000. And then um, I was responsible, thereafter I was responsible for the criminal jurisdiction of the High Court of Fiji. And um, I was able to use uh, the criminology uh, degree that I had from Cambridge to uh, introduce sentencing principles mm -hmm. in the High Court. Previously, the judges simply sentenced either on, you know, what's the going rate, all right, two years imprisonment without any sort of reasoning process, um, or they simply just went with what they felt like, you know, somebody who looks, you know, you feel a little sorry for them. And of course, that kind of decision-making process for the judges is not popular with the public because they see inconsistency, they see nepotism pre creeping in, and often the sentences do not reflect 
the expectations of the public. Of course, they never will, completely. But the judges had to step up and really sentence according to predictable principles that each judge applied. Of course, the result they get is not necessarily the same as another judge, mm -hmm. but the process should be the same. And so I introduced that to the criminal judges with some success and finally, eventually, now, the sentencing principles guidelines have been enacted in legislation. So the judges all follow that. So that's a matter of great pride. Um, and also, while I was a judge, uh, I and the other criminal judges introduced uh, case management for the first time to reduce delay, reduce any chances of judicial corruption or corruption from the registry in the allocation of cases. You remember what I told you about case allocation? Right. In the magistrate's court, I never forgot how easy it is for a judiciary to go down that spiral and become uh, open to manipulation and control. So the case management system was very successful and it was designed to reduce delay, especially people in custody, and also to protect the judicial institution from corrupt activity. So that went on till 2009. And in 2006, we had another coup, a military coup. And uh, during after, three years after the military coup, the constitution was abrogated by the president and all the judges were terminated. And I was one of them. Mm -hmm. So that brought to an end my judicial career. And I went into private practice. I did a lot of training of lawyers mostly in the corporate world on human rights, on corporate governance, um, on um, litigation skills. I did that for several years, five years altogether. And then I was uh, asked by the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Fiji whether I would like to become an ambassador in Geneva, where Fiji was opening the mission for the first time. Mm. And I was very, very excited about that because largely it is work in the Human Rights Council. And human rights has always been a passion. So I said yes, and for eight years, uh, my husband and I were in Geneva. Um, and in the last year, which is 2000, 2021, last year, uh, I became president of the Human Rights Council. I was elected to be president by all the other member states of the council. Um, as a representative of the Asia-Pacific region. And then towards the end of last year, as you know, I was elected uh, to be Deputy Prosecutor. At one point, some, did somebody reach out, call and say, would you be interested in being part of the International Criminal Court? Was, that, was there an aha moment with regards to that? I mean, you were obviously in the field, had a reputation, but all of a sudden there's a, somebody, the call, the call. Well, you know, since the creation of the International Criminal Court, there have been so many calls to Fiji. Yeah. We were one of the first countries which ratified. We have always been interested in the court and in the jurisprudence. And Fiji was a logical country to provide personnel, either for the judiciary or for the prosecution. Mm -hmm. So there have been calls in the past. People have uh, suggested my name in the past. At one time, I was asked to attend training by the uh, uh, Women's Initiatives for Gender Justice, which was then, I think, called the Gender Caucus of the ICC, which ran training for potential women judges. Because uh, the way that the Rome Statute is, is drafted, of course, there is a very clear need to have gender balance in the judiciary. Mm -hmm. So there was a lookout for women judges, and I was a woman judge. Um, but it really never came to fruition, either because my government at the time did not recommend my name uh, for some reason, I'm sure very good, but they did not, uh, or because it was the wrong time for me. Either my children were very small and I didn't really want uh, to disrupt their education, uh, or my husband could not leave Fiji because of the work he did. and I believed that the family should move together wherever they move. So the time was never right. But this time, somehow, um, everything fell into place because I was coming to the end of my term as the president of the Human Rights Council. Uh, I didn't want another term as an ambassador. I thought it was time after eight years to let somebody else do it. Um, and we were thinking either retirement or something else. And just was that when I was beginning to think something else, this was suggested. And my uh, government, the Fijian government, was very keen that they put my name forward. Um, and of course, it isn't a government initiative. The position is chosen on merit and on an individual basis. So there's no lobbying. And that attracted me. 
because I could say to my government, all right, well, thank you very much for that kind suggestion, but now don't do anything. Yeah. Don't do anything. Now I've got to rest on whatever qualifications I have to see whether they are satisfactory. So that's exactly what I did. I sent you know, an application in, I went through the interview process. I was very honored to be shortlisted. When I was shortlisted, I think there was general jubilation in Fiji. There was a lot of media co coverage on the subject and I think the Pacific was proud, not just Fiji, I think the Pacific was proud that I even reached the shortlist uh, because there is a, sometimes a sense of disconnect between the Pacific and the court because not very many Pacific Island lawyers work in the court. Mm -hmm. So there was a sense of, wow, if we get this, even this far, somehow the court has more meaning for us. So there was a lot of interest in the court suddenly. People started to research what the court was about, what cases had been heard. Uh, there was commentary. The Law Society of Fiji started to do sessions on the ICC. So my application really uh, led to some interest in the court, which was great. And then, of course, when I was elected, uh, I think generally the, the community of Pacific nations was very proud. So, and I was proud that they were proud. Yeah. So it was, a, it was a really important moment, I think, in my career. So being the deputy, uh, you're the number two person. Uh, for the camera, how would you describe your, your job position? How, how would you... Well, I'm one of two deputies, okay. um, and uh, as you probably know, there has been a reorganization of the way that the OTP works. Mm -hmm. um, the work is divided amongst uh, three pillars, really. There's pillar A, there's pillar B, and there's the IOP, the Office of the Prosecutor, which is responsible for Ukraine. So um, Deputy Prosecutor Niang, who is from Senegal, and I, are basically twins. I mean, what we do in our pillars is identical, except we have different situations. Um, and what I do is uh, exercise scrutiny and supervision over all the teams, work very closely with them. Uh, and by closely, I mean, really, I really like to roll my sleeves up. It's my personal style. I like to sit with the teams and say, all right, so where's the evidence? What's the downside? Is this person going to come up to proof? Where is this witness? How can we get them? What country in the region will help us to execute this warrant? These are the sorts of questions I like to ask because I believe that uh, teams get confidence from the fact that the deputy prosecutor is showing interest and understands the difficulties in the, in the work that they've put in over many, many months. And a lot of the work that they do is extremely detailed, takes much time and much stress because they are working sometimes in the most difficult political situations. So I think it's really important for deputy prosecutors to be very engaged in all of these very difficult uh, processes. And then my responsibility is to make recommendations to the prosecutor, who, by the way, is also the type to roll up his sleeves and get really into very um, important litigation questions. He's a very experienced uh, barrister. So we've got, I think, three very engaged uh, members of the management of the OTP. This is what makes us tick. I wouldn't have it any other way. There hasn't been a dull moment <laughs> since I joined and I really am finding it a most fruitful exercise. I would say, looking back at my career, that this is probably the most exciting and the one that I enjoy the most. It's, it's ironic. And perhaps it's because when I look back at my domestic career, I look at the most satisfactory moments, the ones where I felt that I was really making a difference. It was those hours at the bar table, not on the bench. Mm -hmm. At the bar table, looking at the assessors, which is our equivalent of the jury, and saying, Madam and gentlemen assessors, this is the case for the prosecution. And really, that was the moment when it all falls into place and you think, yeah, I was meant to do this. I like this. So perhaps it's because of that. That was the most meaningful part of my career as a lawyer. Perhaps that's why I'm enjoying this one so much. Now we know there's a new chief uh, of the Office of the Prosecution. Uh, could you describe him a little bit? Um, he's extremely um, experienced as a prosecutor. But His name again for the camera? Mr. Karim Khan, Queen's okay. Counsel. Um, he's of course a member of the British Bar. Um, and the British Bar is rigorous in its training of barristers. I think the bar finals 
uh, in the UK is probably one of the most difficult exams in the UK. Uh, so he's a British trained barrister. He um, also has been defense counsel in a number of ICC prosecutions and successfully. Mm -hmm. So his clients have in some cases been acquitted as a result uh, of the trial and so on. But he's, most importantly, I think with Mr. Khan, he has a passion for justice. And he has a passion for justice for the most vulnerable and the most marginalized who don't necessarily get any support from anyone else. Mm -hmm. So last week, I went to Sudhan with him. Uh, we were accompanied by our teams. We split up. I uh, attended all the meetings with government ministers. The purpose of the meeting was to encourage the Sudanese government to cooperate with us, to help us in our investigations. Uh, but the prosecutor went to the camps, the IDP camps, mm. the internally displaced persons camps, to talk to those who had been displaced as a result of the conflict in Sudan. And I think he was in his element. He was talking to women, to children, to people who, were, who had lost hope in any other process except the ICC. Mm -hmm. And um, he came back and he said, we cannot let these people down. They believe in us. They believe that we will deliver the kind of justice that they feel that they deserve. And you know, it was a very emotional moment for him yeah. and one for me as well, because I understood in that moment that it's justice that um, empowers him to do his best for the ICC prosecutions. His, the process to become the chief prosecutor, is that a similar to one to which you went through? Is it the uh, nominations and vetting? And, uh, how does that work? Because he's um, appointed by the, the by Assembly of State Assembly Parties. States, yeah. uh, so um, I think it's very similar. Uh, I think that there is uh, a process which is um, based on letters of interest. Again, I think that states from which the, um, the uh, applicants come are not necessarily very active in this process. Right. So, you know, you feel proud that a member of your legal profession is one of the candidates, but it really is a little bit hands off because it is a merit-based process, and I think that's the way it should be. It's such an enormously important position. You do want people who are appointed on merit. Um, and then that ends up, uh, there is a process of vetting. So there is a, a, a subcommittee of the Assembly of State Parties that goes through an interview process, makes recommendations, hopefully leading to consensus. But if there's no consensus, then there's a vote. And in the last occasion, there was a vote. Uh so really, there are the, the, the three, the management team, of the top management team is really the, the chief prosecutor yourself, and then there's one in additional for, for Deputy Prosecutor Niang from Senegal. From Senegal, okay. Um, how important is it to have an African representative? I mean, with, you know, Patu was there, and of course that was a, 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 crit a criticism, perhaps, of the early cases were African leaders. Uh, to have that somebody there in that top group was that a sim not I say symbolic, but is it important to have somebody represent that uh, area of the continent? I think it's important to have geographical representation in the in the uh, office of the prosecutor. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important for us all to have our fingers on political and cultural sensitivities. I think it's very important that when you are conducting investigations in a country that those who are investigating exercise cultural understanding about the context in which offences were committed. Right. And that's not just important for the sake of the uh, relationships that we have with witnesses, it's also important in the way we lead the evidence in court. The court too is diverse and also requires some cultural understanding from us so that we can communicate that. Sure. So I think geographical representation is important, but I don't think that we should, you know, we should go, uh, go to the extent that we say that whoever the chief prosecutor is um, in relation to cultural background or regional uh, origin determines results. Because I think ultimately, whether it's Luis Ocampo, whether it's Fatou Ben Souda, whether it's Mr. Karim Khan, I think these are people of high professional standards and lawyers generally think alike. They don't think like countries, they think like lawyers. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think that each of those chief prosecutors 
have a responsibility to ensure that the court is diverse. And not only that, to ensure that there is gender diversity. Gender inequality is something for which the legal profession is infamous in every country. For many years, women couldn't even become lawyers. And now we can. And yet, legal professions are not necessarily very welcoming. So ensuring that the ICC is gender sensitive and aware and competent and that we take steps to ensure that there is no discrimination against people on the basis of gender or of, of race or ethnicity or religion, I think this reflects on the work we do. Because the more diverse and inclusive we are, the more respectful we are in the relationships we have with each other, I think the more witnesses and victims will understand that we are there to do our professional work and that we're not there with any kind of you know, political agenda, uh, furthering some other agenda which has got nothing to do with the court. So I do think that um, how balanced, diverse, inclusive we are will in its, in its own place reflect on the nature of our investigations and how successful we are. And I think the chief prosecutors really are the guardians of that diversity. In Fiji, you were uh, the first female judge. Uh, you broke some glass ceilings, if I could use the term. Uh, do you feel some sort of, uh, I don't want to say pressure, but here you are at this level. You know, you, you're, you talk about diversity and gender equality from, certainly from coming from Fiji, a relatively small island. You know, here you are there. Do you, do you feel some pressure? Well, let me say this, that when I came back as a qualified lawyer, I'd been to, in a temple, I'd been to Cambridge. I was really quite pleased with myself. I thought I could walk into most jobs in Fiji. But I encountered both racism and sexism. Mm. And even in the office of the DPP, which had never employed a woman before, so I was the first woman prosecutor in Fiji, they told me that we've taken you on with much trepidation because we've never had a woman before, and we had to have a meeting to decide whether we were ready for this. I mean, are we ready for infectious disease? This was the kind of conversation I was having. It was extraordinary. And so then I went through a process of testing, because every day I was being tested as to whether the office was ready for a woman, whether I was going to do the job like a man. And I really hope I didn't do the job like a man because I don't think it's necessary to become a, a man to be a good prosecutor. So all of the experiences that I had as a very young new prosecutor, and of course, we have to remember that a new prosecutor, 22 years old, she is going to be treated in a way which a more senior prosecutor will never see mm -hmm. because harassment, bullying, discrimination, this is reserved for the disempowered. It's, it's a game of power. But I remembered. I dealt with it, but I remembered. And when I became the DPP myself, again the first woman to become the DPP, I said to myself, this is never going to happen to any woman on my watch. And so then I set, as set aside time and expertise. I got experts in to help me to do a gender audit of all our processes, mm -hmm. recruitment, promotion, allocation of cases, because, you know, one of the things I was told as a young lawyer is just, you know, I won't give you any rape cases because you're going to get very emotional as a woman, so you won't be prosecuting rape. I fought and I got the rape cases eventually, but in the allocation of cases, if you're not given the most serious cases, how will you get promoted? Right. So we, we did a gender audit of all of those processes, and I was so proud that when I left uh, to become a judge, we have 50% female prosecutors in the DPP's office. And now I actually think there are more women than men in the DPP's office in Fiji. So, I, and I've never forgotten the lessons that I learned as a 22 year old. I think that women have the advantage of knowing and experiencing gender bias. And women of color know and understand the intersectionality of ethnicity and gender. And if they use those experiences to remove discrimination from the workplace as they get more and more senior and more and more influential, we will make a difference. But it really is a responsibility on our shoulders and we can do it best because we know what it's like. We've lived those experiences. That is not to say that men cannot make those changes, but it means that men need to get 
gender competent and understand what it is like to be a woman and to live those experiences. It's possible, but I think for women there is a special responsibility to be the agents of change. You're remarkable. What's a question I should be asking you that I, I haven't? Uh, here you uh, achieved so much, you're at a, a point of professional pride at this point and uh, perhaps uh, uh, right, right to date the highlight of your career. Uh, what's a question I should be asking? Well, um, you could ask whether you think, whether I think that having a Fijian lawyer in the ICC, a Pacific Island lawyer, uh, and a woman will make any changes on the ground. I suppose you could ask those questions in relation to now, uh, whether uh, I am able to harvest change. And I think the answer to that is yes, because I'm very lucky to be joining the ICC post the Independent Experts Report, which was delivered to the ASP, which pointed out a number of changes that were necessary, not just in the OTP, but also in the judiciary and in the registry. And I'm very proud that we're part of that chapter of the OTP's life, which requires change, because I like change. I think if you don't factor change into any institution, it becomes static, it becomes incompetent, it becomes unable to rise to the challenges of the present. So I'm, I think it does make a difference to be a woman, to be somebody who is from the global south, who understands discrimination very well and who is now working with the prosecutor and the other deputy prosecutor in strengthening the work culture of the OTP. Wow, I've taken up a lot of your time, but you've Not been at all. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. You're here today on the 14th International Humanitarian Law Roundtable. Uh, uh, your boss probably said, you know, We'd love to have you attend, and what do you hope to accomplish here? Well, I'm going to learn a lot. I mean, there's so many experts here, and I've read their articles in the past, and I think I'm very fortunate to be amongst them. So I'm here primarily to listen and to learn, but also to talk about jurisdictional limitations on prosecutions before the ICC, mm -hmm. and to talk about the vision of the prosecutor going forward. So I look forward to that. And of course, our topic of uh, the session is really dealing with Ukraine. And, and uh, you are currently, and don't need to comment on much more than you're investigating uh, some facts on the ground. Yes, but um, as I said, Ukraine falls into the Office of the Prosecutor's uh, responsibility. It's not in my pillar. Mm -hmm. So I'm not directly involved in that investigation. But nevertheless, I look forward to the discussions. Sure. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. It's wonderful.